So there I was. I'm in my late 20s and I'm teaching high school and I am drowning in student loan debt. My wife's a stay-at-home mom. We've got, we're expecting our third kid and my father passed away. Now, I, I want you to imagine that you or me in this situation and you sell your town home, you move in with your mom to kind of help take care of her and the house and ease your own financial burdens. When you meet some men that promise that they can fix your money problems and, and help you find your purpose. And these men kind of become sort of father figures for you in your life, right? Now imagine that they are running a financial scam that left you with literally nothing. What would you do? How would you react? Now this isn't my entire story and it certainly isn't how it ends, but it is how it begins. And actually to tell my story today, I'm gonna use a passage from the Book of Mormon. Not the Broadway musical, I mean the actual Book of Mormon. And I'm gonna use it to frame my journey into four distinct phases because I believe that the lessons contained in this verse are applicable in pretty much any aspect of life. So it reads, and if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Now there are four key words in this verse that kind of walk you through the arc of my story. Weakness, humble, faith, and strong. Now not only are these the keys to my success, but I believe that this is the formula for success and happiness for anyone in any capacity. So let's start my story at the beginning with my weaknesses. A long time ago in a land far, far away called Utah, I was a science teacher and like I said before, I just lost my dad. Now shortly after he died, um, I, I met some men uh, who kind of had this life coaching, financial coaching organization and I became one of their clients. And the whole thing was based on the idea of the sole purpose. You know, the idea that, you know, everyone has a, a unique set of skills and abilities and, and personality traits that when uh, combined would allow them to create value in ways that nobody else can create, right? And the idea was that if you're engaged in your sole purpose, then, you know, your life's going to be the most rewarding, the most fulfilling, the most satisfying that it, you know, the, really the most successful that it could be. You know, it's all very romantic, and uh, to tell the truth, I, I tend to still believe in most of it. Now, to fund the pursuit of their sole purpose uh, for their clients, this organization had kind of a holding fund that we could invest in, and it kind of had this ridiculous interest rate that it paid out. And so, uh, they actually kind of taught us how to really leverage our personal credit to pull equity out of real estate deals. And then we would take that money and invest it into this fund and it would pay out a monthly return large enough to cover our payments. And then we'd make a little bit of extra profit on top. And I ended up building a house right around the corner from my mom and did a couple other real estate deals. And to be honest, things were actually going pretty well for a while. And, uh, you know, looking back, I think these men, I, I believe that they had good intentions when they first started. But when the housing market started failing right around 2007, 2008, the decision was made by somebody to pivot and they started running the whole thing like a Ponzi scheme where they would still take investment from their clients, but then they would use that money to make their payments to everybody else and nothing was actually getting invested anywhere anymore. And by the time that I figured out what was going on, you know, we leveraged my personal credit to the tune of about $1.2 million of debt. Now, obviously as a school teacher, I didn't have that kind of money. And I ended up declaring bankruptcy. Right? And then through a domino effect, I literally lost everything that mattered to me. You know, I, I, obviously I lost my house and most of the things that I owned. Uh, but I also lost my family. And my, I lost my health, and my job, even membership in my church. Not to mention some potentially serious legal issues that I suddenly had to deal with. Now, every dark cloud has a silver lining, and mine really illuminated for me some of my weaknesses. See, I too had good intentions when I started, you know, to provide a better life for my family. And, uh, but eventually, for me, it all became about greed. And I just wanted to get rich quick. In, in addition to this, you know, despite making some 
fairly major financial decisions, it became obvious that I was incredibly ignorant when it came to matters of personal finance. Now this last one's significant because it illustrates is really an example of how weaknesses have a silver lining. With the right perspective, weaknesses can be opportunities, right? And eventually I came to recognize that the education system that I grew up in and, and was still employed by uh, had for the most part pretty much ignored personal finance as a topic of study until probably, I'd say it was about 2005, it started to gain some traction. And, and so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And I developed what I call the real world classroom teaching model for personal finance classes at high school. However, at the time that I first developed and had the ideas for my model, I really wasn't ready to do anything about it yet. See, back then, all I felt was anger and wounded pride. And as we all know, life has a way of humbling those who need it. And I can assure you that losing everything as a result of your own choices, that's a humbling experience. Right? But probably the worst part for me the part that kind of acted as a catalyst for my spiral was really my health, both physically and mentally. Now, the pictures that you see on the screen, um, those are taken about 30 days and I'd say roughly about 45 pounds apart. You know, when I was going through that bankruptcy, I was devastated and I, and I really felt betrayed. And my problems overwhelmed me and my digestive system basically shut down and I started losing weight at a really scary pace. Uh, not to mention, you know, depression and anxiety, they really sunk their teeth in and, and took control of my life. I started making some really bad choices, including an attempted suicide. This picture is actually of the wristband that they gave me at the stabilizing unit of the psychiatric ward that I was admitted to after my attempt. Um, I actually keep that by my desk so that I can see it every day to remind myself that I am not immune to extreme vulnerabilities. Now, obviously it was a failed suicide attempt, uh, but it's probably, well, it's easily the, the failure in my life I'm most grateful for. Now, throughout this whole process, there were many opportunities for me to learn about humility. And I had a phenomenal uh, therapist. His name's Brad Edgington. And he really helped me see things through a healthier perspective. And he, he taught me that I did not have to spend the rest of my life as a victim of a Ponzi scheme. That that was a choice as well. And that the key to freedom was owning my role in the whole thing. See, there's two parts to humility. It's not just about admitting who you're not and what you can't do. It's also about accepting who you are and honestly acknowledging what you can do. See, I'm the one that signed those papers. I'm the one that made major financial decisions without doing the proper due diligence, you know? I'm in control of those kinds of things. And I'm the one in control of whether or not I make those kinds of mistakes again. When a problem exists, true humility manifests itself by identifying what you can do about it. Now, this also happens to be the key to faith. You know, believing that you're part of the solution. I lost my faith. And I didn't actually regain that until I met my current wife, Becca. It was about probably, I was early on in our relationship, I want to say it was about the third date when I kind of felt like she deserved to have it all laid out in front of her. And, and so I sat her down and I, and I said, you know, look, if you think this is any potential going where yeah, there are some things you should probably take into consideration. And then I just kind of went down that list. You know, I'm about 10 years older than she is. She was in her early 20s at the time. I'm divorced and have three kids, right? I'm bankrupt. I didn't, have really, I didn't really have much money and didn't really have a job. And I was getting excommunicated from her church and I just moved back in with my mom and was living in her basement, right? Like this is the greatest dating resume in the history of mankind. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this is exactly what her parents had been praying that she would fall in love with and bring home one day. Uh, regardless though, Becca, she saw things in me and saw potential in me that nobody else saw, not even myself. And she taught me that you are not defined by your last decision. You're defined by your next one. And Becca really helped me regain my faith. My faith in humanity, my faith in God, even my faith in myself. And that's critical. 
Because in order to be a part of the solution, yes, you've got to believe in the solution. Man, you've also got to have faith in your ability to execute that solution. Once I had regained my faith, I was ready to exercise it to execute my solution. I was finally ready for my weaknesses to become strength. I spent about 10 years developing my teaching model. I went, I went back to school. I got certified to te teach banking and finance. I went on to get a master's degree in teaching methodologies. I'm currently enrolled in Vanderbilt, getting my doctorate in education. And I developed an economic system that kind of converts classes into an ongoing role-playing game. It really goes on in the background of the course. It's, it's really, it's more of a cultural component to the class than anything else, where students get paid a virtual salary just for being in the class. And then one week in class represents a month in the real world. So every week on Monday they get paid, and every week on Friday they've got bills that are due. They've got financial goals that they work towards. They buy assets. They take on liabilities. And they can use their discretionary money within this system to buy actual real privileges in class. Like, you know, I want to keep my phone today, or I need to go to the bathroom and buy a hall pass or a, a voucher for late work assignments. Um, they even buy points that then get applied as assignments in class. And so, you know, when a grade comes due, if you've been budgeting wisely and learning from your mistakes, write me a check. You get an A. If not, you get whatever you can afford. Now, all these other decisions you've been making, now they carry weight. Now they have consequences because we've made the money real. You're making real financial decisions. Right? Uh, honestly, it's amazing, and I absolutely loved fine-tuning it in, in my own classes. Because during that time, probably more than any other as an educator, I, man, I got addicted to the impact that I was making in the lives of my students every year. Um, pretty soon I was speaking at conferences, kind of... And, and other schools were interested in how they could do what I was doing as well. And, and, but I needed some more sophisticated technology, so I called up my best friend. His name's Preston. Brilliant computer programmer. Uh, Preston and I started a company. And then before we knew it, hundreds of schools and thousands of students across the country were using the real-world classroom to learn about personal finance. And then I'd say probably about a year or so out to market, we caught the attention of a larger ed tech firm. They liked what they saw, and they offered to buy our company, um, ironically, for more than I lost in the Ponzi scheme. And so the decision was made in 2019, and we sold. And now they're about to surpass the 100,000th student mark. Talk about turning weakness into strength. Now, the reason why my model is so successful, the reason why it works so well in the classroom, is because it's based on the concept and the principle that there is no predetermined path to student success. It's all about choices, just like in the real world. Right? Let me explain it this way. The maze that you see here kind of represents what I believe uh, most teachers, how they approach their job. Right? They have this perspective that their job is to prepare students to navigate the maze of life so that when they come to a decisional crossroad, they know, you know, turn left, turn right, go straight. And for the most part, I think they're right. Uh, but I think they're wrong in one very important aspect. You know, that's not what the maze looks like. Okay, this is what the maze looks like. There is no preset path of right and wrong. There's only choices. And sometimes we move forward, and sometimes we move sideways, and as I can certainly attest to, sometimes we move backwards. But it's like Pythagorean said, choices are the hinges of destiny. And I submit to you today, that any choice that you make, that you learn from, that's forward progression. No one would have scripted my life the way it's playing out. But through the process of converting weakness into strength, through humility and faith, I've been able to achieve levels of success and regain levels of happiness that I once thought were lost and beyond my reach. And that's a process that we can all take advantage of. Thank you.